Good morning. Good morning. We give you all a warm welcome this morning. Delighted to have always joined with us. We're delighted to have Ronald and Marianne's family here, and we give you a warm, warm welcome. Uh, we also welcome those who are at the drive-in and those who are listening on YouTube later, and just pray that it will be an encouragement and blessing as we worship together. Uh, as we commence, can I just remind you of a, a few announcements? Uh, Zoom prayer meeting on Wednesday night as normal. Uh, please join with us if you can. And then next Sunday will be normal and God willing, I will be here. Uh, anyone who would like to help with the online holiday Bible club, please get in touch with Faith Martin in the next few days as we're getting our program put together. And if you can help, please do. We'll be just delighted to help you. Uh, we're sad on Friday to learn of the Duke of Edinburgh's death. And it's only right and proper that we would just remember him uh, and remember especially our majesty and our family at this time of sadness and loss. So as we come to our opening prayer, let's pray. Eternal God and Father, as we come to worship, and we just thank you for all who have joined with us. And pray, Father, as we worship together, that we'll know your sense, we'll know a nearness of God, and we'll know a, a real love and care and concern for each other. We thank you, Father, for our royal family, and we're sad to learn of the Duke's death on Friday, uh, and we just give thanks for all that he has done in that long life, for all the service, service in the Navy during the Second World War, for the Duke of Edinburgh Award, for all his concern for the Commonwealth and the people of the Commonwealth, uh, and for conservation and just preserving the planet. And we know he did a tremendous amount of charity work and we give you thanks for it. We remember Her Majesty the Queen. We thank you, Father, for the stable reign of over 70 years. She has always been the same. She seems to always get things right and we rejoice in that. And we just pray be with her as she's lost her consort. And she'll know your help and your presence in these sad days. Remember the royal family. We pray that you'll be near to each, you'll comfort them, strengthen them. And Father, through these days, they'll know the hand of God upon their life. Be with us here this morning. Be with us in the baptism. Be with us through the singing and the preaching of the word. We pray that our time together will be rich and profitable. And you'll meet with us, whether we're in the church, whether we're in the drive-in, or whether we listen in future later. Our glory and honour will be brought to your name. Your people will be encouraged and built up and others will thank you unto Christ. In him we ask. Amen. We thank God for our musicians and for calling down the controls. And Ellen and Zoe are going to lead us as we come to worship.
you, Ellen and Zoe. That's so appropriate this morning, especially our text. Uh, Deirdre is going to read the scriptures for us, John chapter 3, 1 to 18. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to follow along. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, commencing at verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Amen. Thanks, dear Jane. We pray that God will bless us for to each one of us. We're delighted to be baptised in Holland and Brown's baby daughter. And before we do that, we'll sing the uh, first two verses of God sent his son, and then we'll have the baptism. <laughs>
baptism remember the words of the Lord Jesus after his resurrection and before his ascension to the right hand of God. All power and authority is given unto him in the name of Jesus. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And teach them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Gloria and Balgatha wrote, How sweet to hold a newborn baby, and feel the pride and joy that he or she gives. True, many of us have known that joy and pride, as we talk about proud parents in the right sense of word. Of course there can be many problems and trials along the way. Let us sleep at night, isn't it? Supposed to be parents lose 44 days of sleep in the first year with the newborn babe. I'm sure you know all about that. Uh, we talk about he or she rules the house. Whenever she cries, we jump. But we wouldn't do without them. We want the best for our children. We want the best food, best school, best clothes. But the best start is to be brought up in a Christian home where mom and dad love Jesus and love each other and want to see their little one come to the Saviour. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 1, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first was in your grandmother Lois, and then in your mother Eunice, and is now in you. As we would say, Timothy took in the gospel with his mother's milk. And because of that, he became such a, a mighty and powerful servant of God. We want to teach our children the word of God. We want to pray for them and pray with them. To see and hear, them, to see and to hear the gospel. To know God's spirit moving. The home, a place of joy and peace and security in Richmond for the cooperate with the church. It's great to be in a church where there's much involvement and much interest in children and young people. Good Christian leaders and helpers with an enthusiasm and a zeal for the Lord and a lovely group of children and young people. Parents and grandparents supporting and encouraging, providing taxi services, and lifting the bills. A privilege to be the privilege of a child growing up in a God honouring environment. It's great to be in a praying church where you and your child is prayed for and early in life that that child comes to the Saviour. It's wonderful to be in a welcoming church where people go out of their way to make you feel welcome. Everyone feels welcome and wanted. When family and friends come to the church, they are made part and made feel at home. May these things help us to know Christ and to walk in his ways. It is the duty of those who present their children for baptism to confess their faith within there to be baptized and to promise to bring them up and the faith and learned your nation of the Lord. Grant and Miriam, can I ask you to stand as you take your vows? And can I ask all of us to stand, just as a symbol of the oneness and unity. In presenting your child for baptism, do you confess your faith in God and as your Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ as your Saviour Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? Do you promise, in the defense of divine grace, to teach her the truths and duties of the Christian faith, and prayer precept example to bring her up in the nurtured admonition of the Lord? Ellen Elizabeth, I baptize you in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The ironic blessing.
Father, thank you for Helen and Elizabeth. Thank you that just all her faculties, just healthy and well and thriving and doing well. May she grow up into a strong, healthy girl. Pray early in life she comes to know and to love the Lord Jesus as her friend and saviour. Remember Ronald and Miriam? Thank you for their love and commitment to the saviour. Encourage them as Christian friends. May they know the hand of God upon their family and their needs be met in Jesus. Remember the other children gathered with me and other children belong to us. We thank you for every child. Each one are precious to you and precious to us. Help us to love them into the kingdom. Help us to teach them and encourage them. Richly bless each. Remember the mums and dads. We thank you for them. Just be with them. May they know and love you and walk in Christ. And bring their children up to know and to walk in Christ. Remember the grandparents. We know grandparents have such a big role to play. Be with them. Remember the whole family circle gathered here today of Ronald and Miriam's. Be with them and help them and richly bless them. And may Jesus come to be first in our lives. Remember all the children and young people of this church. We love them dearly. Work subtly and powerfully in each of their lives that Jesus will be everything. For our Sunday school teachers, our youth leaders, for all who takes to do with their children and young people, be with them and help them. And may they be wonderfully used and wonderfully blessed of you. For it's in the precious name we pray. Amen. Can we go back and sing verses 2 and 3? Uh, how, come to the words, right? uh, how sweet to hold a newborn baby. Remember the unrest and especially in Belfast. And we know that can snowball 
lead into something that's very difficult. We know that there's no handy solutions to it. And we pray and we look to you for wisdom for all involved. Remember our Prime Minister, our Secretary of State and our Executive. And lovingly and caringly, we bring them to you. Remember, Father, about the debates and storming. And we know there's two serious issues coming up. There's the one, Father, about uh, abortion, and, and the other one, Father, about whether we're being freedom to preach the gospel, whether we've got the freedom to pray and to pastor people. And Father, we believe that those are very serious, and it's our prayer that both of them will defeat it, Father. We believe that killing babies is wrong. We believe in the gospel, and there should be that freedom to preach the gospel wherever it be. Guide and lead and direct. Remember our vacancy. We pray for Mark as our convener. We pray for the sessions. We pray for the whole congregation as they think about and who might be a suitable candidate to occupy this pulpit. Pray that they'll be guided and led by you. We know, Father, we're in Ramadan and we know that Muslims spend much more time in prayer. We pray that such a time as this that they might be open to the gospel Remember those who are reaching out the gospel to them. Pray that they'll be helped and blessed and used of you. As we turn to your word, speak into our hearts and lives. For it's in the Lord Jesus we ask. Amen. Sometimes you get confused by the gospel. Many people at times get confused. What is the gospel? But in the Bible... There's no confusion. It's just a confusion that we want to make. It's good to have your own opinions. It's good to hear the opinions of others. But remember, it's the Bible as the final authority. We find that Nicodemus at night comes to talk with Jesus. That there seems to be some misunderstanding, first of all, what Jesus is talking about. First of all, about human nature can be changed. You know, you know the old saying, what you're born with, you're stuck with. And Jesus is coming and opening up and talking about Nicodemus, about human nature. But then he very quickly moves on to about how to get into heaven. How can we be right with the living God? Nicodemus things came to Jesus at night because there were issues he, he wanted to learn about. He, he felt that Jesus was a great teacher and would come and teach him. Yet just as what we learn maybe going on a course about computers or about uh, something or like a, a time management or business schemes, that somehow Jesus would teach Nicodemus. But we find that he makes two serious mistakes. He comes first of all and thinks that Jesus is a great teacher and would teach him. But he will, just as people get it, but you know, what does Presbyterians believe? What does Church of Ireland believe? Oh, what does Roman Catholics believe? And, and he saw it in a sphere. But we find that Jesus telling him, he hasn't come as a great teacher, but rather he has come as a life giver, as a new creator. Don't make that mistake in your own life. The second great mistake Nicodemus makes, that he thought Jesus was coming to him to offer him a new start. That many people don't like the phrase born again. And they somehow feel it's like, how can someone on in years go back into their mother's womb? But Jesus was not coming to tell a new start. And many people long for a new start in their life. They say, if I had my life to live over again, and I think of the mistakes, life would be different. But in your reality, it wouldn't be much different at all. That the old sinful nature will still be there, still controlling their life. You know what it is with the New Year resolution? How quickly 
is forgotten about. And what we find in verse 6 says, as Jesus talks to Nicodemus and he comes and he says to him, in verse 6, flesh give birth to flesh, but the spirit give birth to spirit. The nature that you're born with needs to be changed. It needs to be transformed. What Jesus is coming talking about, he's not saying to about, well, the necessity is an interest in religion, or, or adopting an attitude that Christianity or teaching. But what he's saying for us, it starts with a miracle, for a mighty work of God in our life. And as we come and turn to John 3 this morning, there are three things that I want to come and speak of. Three necessities of life. First of all, the necessity of a new birth. Secondly, the necessity of Jesus' death. And thirdly, the necessity of saving faith. First of all, the necessity of Jesus' birth. When you read John chapter 3, you find there's a, a sense of come up, come up, uh, uh, this is something has compulsion. That we, it's not take it or leave it, but rather this is something we need. Uh, if you want to know God, uh, if you want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you want to be in heaven, then you need to be born again. It's universal as unchanging, as indispensable for everyone. It's not something that, well, some people desire it, others don't desire it. It's a necessity for each one of us as we want to be in heaven. When you think of a new birth, what are the questions that comes into your mind? Let me just briefly Look at four of them. First of all, what is the new birth? What was Jesus talking about? Well, let me turn and read from Benjamin Warfield, who was one of the old theologians and held in high regard and high respect. He says, it's a radical and complete transformation wrought in the soul by the Holy Spirit. By virtue of which we become a new people, be increasingly changed from lawless, godless, self seeking to revealing a new nature of repentance and love for God, a desire to know Him and comply with His perfect will. What's that? That first of all, there's a repentance in our lives, that the Holy Spirit comes into our life. That there's a new desire. That we want to honour him. We want to bring glory to his name. We don't want to live for the things of the fallen world. Why is it necessary to be converted? Some people say, well I live a good life. I do my best. I, I can help a lone, lean dog over a stile any day. If I see somebody in need, I'll help them. I, I'll live a much better life than some of those so-called Christians. But you see, that will never get us into heaven. Because the old sinful nature is still there. It's still guiding, it's still controlling our lives. God can't love us and care for us as he wants to. He can't receive us into heaven. Maybe a third line. In some circles, will renew birth as Luke down upon. Maybe, maybe that's something that puts you off from becoming a Christian. Could it be that one of the things that puts you off it? You, you, you get the impression that some Christian people think that they're better than other people. But that should never be the case. We should be a humble, lowly, contrite people. The goodness is not in us, 
but of St. Christ. And the other heart, you could be put off. Because maybe as you look at some questions, you think that there's something very hypocritical. It's not really genuine. But my dear people, that should never be the case. We should be a hundred pence in the pound Christians. That we should be genuine and real in everything we do and everything we say. Maybe in the other hand, we feel it's not necessary. It's not absolutely essential that you live a good life. You do your best. You're faithful to church. But you see, God can't love you. God can't take you into heaven without that transformation, without that spiritual, mighty, miraculous work in our lives. God cannot love you. So he wants to love you. Fourth thing, what difference does it make? Well, it's not like the, the lady who was encouraging her daughter to trust the Lord. She says, go on, do it. Sure, it will not make much difference. I want to say to you, man, it will make a great difference in your life. Instead of the old selfish spirit controlling your life, that there's a new spirit, a new love for Christ. Jesus says, the Bible says, it is a necessity. First of all, the necessity of the new birth. Secondly, the necessity of Jesus' death on the cross. John chapter 3 and verse 14 there, we find this, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and he says there in verse 14, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, what's Jesus referring to? Well, it's back to the time when the children were Israel in the wilderness. And, and God was punishing them for their disobedience. And, and, and these poisonous snakes were biting the people. And they came and they cried unto Moses. And, and Moses took the matter to God. And God told Moses, take a bronze serpent, put it in a pool, and put up that pool. And, and for everyone who looks to the certain pool, they'll be healed. Now, not everybody look to the certain pool, but only those who looked and already looked to the pool were healed. Likewise, the Lord Jesus says, all need to come and respond to his love and his care and come to know him and trust him. There is no new birth without the death of Jesus. He bore the wrath and punishment of God. He is our Redeemer. He is our subject. Can you see that on the cross he paid your debt for sin? Stuart Townen put it so beautifully in that hymn, How Deep the Father's Love. And he writes in the second verse, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. The necessity of the new birth and that miraculous transaction taking place in your life. The necessity of Jesus' death on the cross. And thirdly, the necessity of saving faith. This spiritual transformation that Jesus talks about, how does all the riches that God has in Christ become ours? In other words, what's the bridge? What's the bridge that takes it into our lap that can be ours, a new life? Well, the best known verse in the Bible and the most loved verse in the Bible. Job 3, 16, 17 and 18. 
starts so simple, so clear. For God so loved the world that he gave us one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the Son of God. Or, or just turn over to chapter 1 and the verses 12 and 13. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in him, he has the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor of a husband's love, but born of God. How does it become ours? Through faith through saving faith and coming to reach out Christ to those who believe in his name. He gave the right to become the child of God. Now there's a difference between general faith and personal faith. Think of it like this. Say you were to go down into Cookstown there and do a survey and go around and knock the doors and ask the people, do you believe in God? And probably you'll find 85% will say that in some way or other they believe in God. But they're not saved. Their lives have not been transformed. And so it's not saving faith. Let me try in a number of ways to explain it to you. If I to say to you, do you believe in modern medicine? Yes. My granny wasn't well and, and she needed an operation. She went to the hospital and they restored her to full health and strength. But saying you're not well and you're seriously ill. And I say to you, do you believe in Dr. So-and-so that you're willing to commit your life into his hands to perform an operation? that he might restore you to health and strength. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about marriage. And there are certain questions to a husband and wife about their commitment to each other. And what the Lord Jesus, God is, the Lord Jesus said, that he is the heavenly bridegroom. And God the Father says to you, will you have my son my precious Son, the Lord Jesus, to be your Saviour, to be your friend, to be the Lord of your life. We're not saying, are you a religious person? We're not saying, do you go to church? But it's placing yourself into the hands of the Lord Jesus. I'm sure many times you've travelled between Bush Mills and Ballycastle. And you know well the character we preach. And people come from all over the world to see character bridge. And they'll stop the car and, and they'll go down in and stand at the end of the bridge. And you say, Do you believe that the, the bridge is safe? Oh yes. Do you believe that the bridge will carry? Oh yes. But they're paralyzed and they don't go any further and they never cross the bridge. Maybe you're here this morning and you know the need of having the Lord Jesus save you. You know that He's willing to save you and you want Him to be your Savior, but you never get there. You never ask. To be your saviour and your lord. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to us whether you walk across the Calvary Bridge or not. But it means all the difference between heaven and hell. Whether you receive the Lord Jesus as your own personal saviour. When you reach out and receive him, and know the joy of sins forgiven and what it is to be his child. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he's such a wonderful friend. And he wants to come into our lives and perform the miracle above all the miracles to make us new people in Christ, knowing sins forgiven and what is to be your child and rest from it. Work deeply and powerfully in all our lives. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus we ask. Amen. If I can help to anyone or anyone who would like to talk to me, please do so. Pass me not, a gentle Saviour. Son and Holy Spirit, rest on each one of us. Amen.